Lesson number three, we're coming to the Africans and Zambians today. And we're here in our church building. I'm Dr. Randy Davis. This is Billy Sampson. And uh, we're working out some bugs from the cameras and the VCRs and the tapes and all that. But I know you'll understand and we'll perfect it as we go along. We were asked today to, to talk a little bit about dedication of children and why it's important in the church setting and uh, why we do it and to mainly address that a little bit. So this is tape number two. The previous tape was done about, uh, what were the subjects? Funerals uh, and uh, funerals and counseling. Funerals and premarital counseling, counseling, yes. Yeah. Just skimmed the surface of that, but today we're on the dedication of children. We'll look at Psalms 127, verse three. Before we do that, we'll have a prayer. Father, I thank you for those that's listening to us today. And we would ask that the Holy Spirit would help us to have insight yes. about this subject and convey this information to your brothers there and our spiritual sons there, Lord, and may they be edified because of it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to look at Psalms 127, verse 3. All right, Psalms 127, verse 3 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. All right, so it's a good thing to have children, isn't it? And that is God's plan. No children meant in the, in, to the Jewish mind that God was not pleased with them, especially if they didn't have a son to carry on the family name. That's right. So it's a blessing to have a son if you're married, but especially children. We go back to Genesis 9 and verse 1. And we find out a little bit about God's plan for this family and the, and the children and so forth and so on. Genesis 9 verse 1. Genesis 9 1 said, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Right. Notice that uh, Noah's sons were working with him. Right. And it's my conviction that if possible, the, the family should work with the pastor. The family shouldn't leave the pastor's endeavor because it's a family ministry, not just one person. Like the wife comes in, the children, and they're all part of the, the work of God. Just like Shem, Ham, and Zapeth helped Noah in the work of God in their lifetime. So they all work together, and God told Noah and his sons and, and their wives to replenish the earth. Yes. That means to have children, basically, and uh, to expand the human race through procreation. Children sometimes are dedicated to God before their birth. A lot of people don't know that, but uh, the Bible teaches about Moses in uh, Exodus 2.10. Yes, Exodus 2.10 says, And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Right. So in this case, he, it was after his birth. But uh, the point is that God knew in advance, and, and uh, Moses' mother had basically committed Moses to God. Um, Samuel is another one, the prophet Samuel. Uh, there's a scripture about him in 1 Samuel 1.20. Uh, 1 Samuel 1.20, Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come about, come about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. Right. So right from the beginning then, um, the baby Samuel was dedicated to the Lord. So there must be a scriptural implication here and a reason for children to be dedicated to the Lord. There's another case about a person being dedicated to the Lord before he was born. That's the one I wanted to really get to is uh, John or Luke. Was, was John the Baptist actually in uh, Luke 1.60? Um, 
Verse 60, And his mother answered and said, Not so, but he shall be called John. Right. So God told him what to call him, call the baby before he was born. So they, they had dedicated uh, John to the work of the Lord before he ever came into this world, so to speak. So those imp spiritual implications here also in uh, St. John 21, 5. We have another scripture about this subject, perhaps. John 21, 5. Then Jesus said unto him, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, No. The men were talking about children here. Uh, the disciples were referred to as children. Right. And you know, it's okay to be God's children, just don't be childish. I know there's no childish acting people in Zambia or Johannesburg, only here, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so basically, people are the same everywhere, carnal, babies, fleshly, and they have to be taught the ways of God, which is the assignment of the church. We as God's children, we depend upon God our Father. Likewise, babies and young people, children, we could say, natural children, depend upon their parents to take care of them. So the same principle applies like, you know, to a child, the parents responsible for the child, yes. feed him, give him a place to stay, and, you know, meet his needs, clothe him, so forth and so on. And likewise, that's the way the father does us. He takes care of us, and, and then the parents will take care of their children. Same, it's the same format, basically. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.8 is a scripture we can look at. 1 Timothy 5.8, But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. All right. So this is not only talking about children, but, but any part of your family. Right. Uh, let's say your, your mother or your widow, or your mother's a widow, or your, your dad's a widower, Maybe he's sick and can't get around. But primarily, I think this is talking about uh, the family setting, the family structure, and uh, taking care of the children in the family. Here in America, we've got a big problem of the, the children don't have parents. Or they may have one parent. Right. Or they may uh, be illegitimate. And all these problems come into the church, and we have to try to deal with it best we can. But it is a problem that, that occurs primarily, as we're, talking, we're going to be talking about the dedication of babies. Uh, the parents are responsible to take care of their, child, their children. You know, if people would think about that before they get married and before they have kids, they may be reluctant to, to be so hasty in their marriages and their uh, wanting to hurry up and have kids because once, once you bring a, a child into the world, um, then the next 20, 30 years, maybe it's never over. <laughs> but, but let's say at least 20 years, you're, you have responsibility to take care of those children and to raise them in the ways of the Lord. I, I did notice uh, in Zambia how the whole community uh, there in Tatumbila um, took care of the kids, the whole, the whole community. Uh, they, the parents really didn't worry about the kids going out and playing with other kids, and, but yet they were still responsible for them. And I even asked Pastor Paul, you know, if there were any orphans there, and he said not so much in their area just because um, if the parents had died, whoever was below that family member would take care of the kids, whether it was grandparents or whatever, those kids were always taken care of no matter what. And that's not so in America, it seems like. No. Well, that's kind of like the biblical kinsman redeemer in the, in the scriptures. Yeah. If the husband would die, well, uh, the wife could go to the next of kin if he wanted her, and then, you know, they, they didn't just sever every tie just because a tragedy hit or whatever. Right. They, they stuck together, kind of like a tribe. Well, they're known as the 12 tribes of Israel, so... <laughs> It seems that they're more biblical in Africa than... Yeah, in many ways. In many ways. Yeah, in many ways. Did we get to 2 Timothy 1.5? 
No, we'll read that. Second right. Timothy 1, 5. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Okay, so what I wanted to say about this scripture was that it seems that the grandparent had the ability to impart certain spiritual things to right. her child and then right on down the line. So the, the, the parents are to impart certain God-given spirituality, spiritual principles, I should say, to their children. Yes. And uh, one of those assuredly was faith, the spirit of faith. And uh, that's what we need to really think about when we're, we are um, getting ready to dedicate a child. Now, we haven't done a lot of children dedications in our church here in, in Missouri, but uh, the ones that we have done, we've got to first realize that when we have parents bring their baby to the front of the church congregation to be dedicated to the Lord, uh, we've got to understand what that means. Right. First off, we've got to realize that this baby is in a state of innocence. Now, usually they bring them, you know, little, little ones. Yes. But sometimes they're up, you know, two, three, four years old. Depends upon when they're saved, what God tells them to do. Um, but we're assuming all the, all the children that are dedicated to the Lord are too young to really know what salvation is. So there's a reason why um, maybe there's some tradition here about dedicating babies. Yeah. But you remember when, when they brought baby Jesus to the temple on the eighth day? Yes. So there, there's some spiritual principles here. And mainly it's recognition of our need of God in our lives and in our children's lives. And so it takes an act of faith to bring your child up. But I wonder when parents bring their, ch their, their child or their children to the front to have the, the pastor pray over them and dedicate the babies and the young people to the Lord, I wonder who's being dedicated. Because, right. you know, there's such things as rededication. Yes. So what I do is... Not only do we dedicate the babies, but we try to, to rededicate the parents. Amen. Because if they're not 100% sold out to God, it's not going to mean much. It's just a, a ritualistic thing that people like it, and it's sweet and all that. But we need to get down to business about discipleship and what really matters, don't you think? Yeah, most people, I believe, when they come to dedicate their child, they're thinking of what they've seen in movies or whatever, mm -hmm. when they bring them to the priest. Right. Uh, they sprinkle them or whatever they do. But that's, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it, if it's tradition, that might be what it is here. But I think it's more of what they've seen on TV and right. think that that's the right thing to do because yeah. they're new in the Lord they're in, or what, whatever. Right. So we, we've got to understand then that these, the young ones that we're talking about, baby dedications, young children dedications, we've got to understand that uh, they're in a state of innocence and they're in the grace of God. And if they were to prematurely die, they'd go to heaven. Right. Because they don't, they don't know what sin is. They're too young to know right and wrong. And they're in a state of grace and innocence before the Lord. However, uh, it, it would certainly be a blessing if the parents were Christians. Yes. We get into all this stuff. Uh, We've got to first figure out, are the parents saved? See, it, it's, it's going to be difficult to dedicate a baby to the Lord if neither parent have received Jesus yet. <laughs> right. You know, what are you going to do in that situation? Right, right. Are, are one saved? One parent saved? Uh, so we've got all these things to think about and deal with in a simple baby dedication. And it has to be done thoroughly and, and uh, sufficiently. One thing about this baby that, that I thought about that uh, 
we need to think about is children are born in debt to God. You know that? Yeah. Everyone that's born of a woman is in debt to God. With the debt they cannot pay. What's that song we sing? He owed the debt, he did not owe, I owed the debt, I could not pay, I needed someone to wash my sins away, and so forth and so on. So, <clears throat> when we dedicate the baby to the Lord, we need to make sure the parents understand that even though this baby is in a state of innocence and grace, when they come to a place of knowledge of sin and need of the Savior, they, they got to realize that they have a sin debt that only Jesus could pay. Right. And they are not able to pay it except trusting in Jesus that he already paid it for them. So the charge then, when we come to the charge, so let's say, for example, the parents bring the baby up to the front from the congregation. What does the pastor do? How do you dedicate a baby to God? Well, we have to follow the Spirit, of course, and weigh through all these situations it could be. But I, I think the pastor needs to take the baby in his arms as yes. a symbol of acceptance. Right. And then, of course, somewhere along the way, you need to anoint with oil and pray, pray over the baby. But that's not all there is to baby dedication. There's a lot of things that comes into play here. For example, the charge, the charge, the charge is to the parents, not the baby. Right. I mean, what good is it going to do, <laughs> you know, to have this little baby? Now, I charge you to live right before God, so forth and so on, and not do this and do that, and keep God first. What good is that going to do? <laughs> Nothing. Not what good thing. would it do to sprinkle or baptize or confirm? What good is that? <laughs> not a thing. So we're endeavoring to keep people in the faith realm and not something that we can do right to to justify you know our our lives or whatever so we need to charge the parents and so really when parents bring their baby up to be dedicated the, the pastor once again must acknowledge the baby pray over the baby and, and, and explain to the congregation that children are heritage of the lord that that they're a blessing and they're given to parents uh to be an aid in the ministry and the blessing and so forth and so on. But we've got to get around to charging the parents. It's kind of like uh, ordination service. Remember that ordination service we had then? Yes. Well, that was a, a charge to the individual ministers there. And it's the same way with parents when it comes to their children. Uh, some ministers, some pastors say, it's kind of like a wedding. Do you, brother so-and-so, pledge to take care of this little one? Uh, you know, you, you come up with your own words, but after you're through giving this charge, they must say yes or no. Or we don't proceed. <laughs> That's right. So it comes down to this. Does God give the authority to a pastor to pronounce a blessing on a soul? And I say yes, he does. Amen. Yes, he that does. That all authority is given to the church, and you have the ability to, to bless or not bless. Anyway, we've got to give the charge to the parents and not the baby. And one of the aspects in this charge is, is to make sure the parents understand uh, that they are charged by, by the Lord God to, to as soon as possible bring this child to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, how they do that is up to them. But I think one way they can do that is the life. Do yes. they go to church? Do they believe the Bible? Do they, uh, are they Christians? And uh, to teach the children right from wrong according to the Bible. So it's the parent's charge and the parent's responsibility to bring that child to Jesus. Excuse me, it's not the church's responsibility. The way God looks at it, it's the parents' responsibility. But here in America, what do they do? They drop their kids off at church while they do their own thing. 
and expect the church to, to fix everything. Right. And it's, the, it's definitely the parents that need to be teaching the kids the Word of God and teaching them right from wrong and everything that, that, that is shown in the Scripture here. And like uh, Dr. Davis was saying, it's, it's not the church's responsibility, not the Sunday school teacher's responsibility. Of course, they do teach them a little bit, but uh, it's always the parent's responsibility to mm -hmm. tell them right from wrong. That is uh, right. definitely a fact there. Exactly. So this vow then is really to the parents. Mm -hmm. Baby dedication deals with the parents. Yes. And not so much the baby. And I also think that uh, we should, as ministers, or uh, you there in Zambia, that you should tell the parents all of this before the dedication keeps going. That, uh, and you, you've had it in your notes here, was not to baptize the kid when they're... Right. And uh, they have to come to the saving knowledge of that themselves. Uh, the the kid is himself or herself must uh, understand what baptism is for. That baptism doesn't save you, uh, doesn't cleanse you. Only Jesus Christ can, and uh, that the minister must tell the parents this before the dedication is taking place. Because a lot of parents yeah. will probably come up and want their kid baptized. Oh yeah. And and the kid really doesn't mm -hmm. understand, and it's up to the parents, as we were saying. Mm -hmm. to teach the child what baptism means and what being saved and born again means. Right. I've had people in church here that left because I wouldn't baptize their kids. <laughs> or, you know, but you have all different situations you have to deal with, but we've got to emphasize these truths when it comes to this baby dedication, which is not a total service, but it's just inserted in the normal service. You don't make a whole service out of this. Right. It's right. interjected like receiving a communion would be interjected, or baptism would be interjected, mm -hmm. whatever. But it's a part of the church service, and it's meant to edify the parents and other people watching. Because they get to think, well, maybe I need to dedicate my kid to the Lord. Well, let's get them dedicated first, then we'll, right. then, you know, <laughs> first things first. You can't put the cart before the horse, as we say here in Missouri. But people try. All right, let's say that the baby's at the front now, and, and what's, what does the, the pastor do? Well, I think he should take the baby in his arms and uh, pray over the baby. And the prayer should involve uh, being, having the child dedicated to God for God's service. Amen. We're just not doing something to be doing something. And uh, there's a certain amount of authority in the clergy that, that has the God-given authority to, to do these things. And it really shows submission with the, to the, about the parents, I should say, if it shows whether or not they're submitted to the office of pastor or not. Right. If they, yes, uh, mom and dad can, can commit their child to the Lord, but when you have the under-shepherd do it with them, then it shows me that they understand authority. They understand that Christ is the head of the church, the pastor is the under-shepherd, the parents are, are under him, and the children are under the parents. That's right. And in that order. And if we get that out of order, then we're going to have big trouble. Yes. As most do sooner or later. <laughs> so we've got to uh, pray over the baby and then dedicate that baby's life to the service of God. And also we've got to ask God to protect this baby and help the parents bring the baby to a saving knowledge of Jesus as soon as possible. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 14. See if I got First Corinthians seven fourteen. For the un unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Right. So there's a certain amount of truth 
to even one parent being saved. It seems like it, it, it carries a little weight with as far as being separated to the work of the Lord. Yes. Uh, in comparison to, let's say, people that are not saved and their child just grows up like a weed and there's no discipline or authority or teachings of the Scripture for that kid, he's in trouble. Right. And unless the gospel gets to him, he won't make it. You know, especially if he gets the age of accountability. And Now, the age of accountability, what do you think that might be? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I believe it's probably different for every child, I guess. Um, as some children are blessed by God, I believe, with a lot more brain power than some. And uh, mm. it also probably depends on how much the parents mm. have taught their kid. And it might depend upon years. how much the parents have been taught. Yeah, and it, it, <clears throat> it depends on if the parents, you know, when they got saved when the, when the child was little. And, and like I said, just how much... Only God knows. Only sure. God knows, yes. <laughs> but we assume that as a general rule of thumb, 12 years old. Yeah. We assumed that because Jesus had left his earthly parent and stepfather to go and teach in the synagogue at the age of 12. Right. And they said, yeah. where's he at? He's lost, you know, and they went and found him. And, and he replied with a wisecrack, don't you know I must be about my father's business? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, so they brought 12-year-old Jesus back to the, the, the uh, caravan and and the Bible says that Jesus was subject to his parents. He I've often wondered. <laughs> <laughs> I've often wondered did they did they speak did they spank God in the flesh? You know, <laughs> <laughs> and and if they did, uh, he took it. Yep. So he was tempted in all points like that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, so it's interesting. Uh, in this First Corinthians seven fourteen, we assume that the parents are church members. So here again, a pastor doesn't have any authority or, or right to, to dedicate a child to God when the, 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 the child's parents don't attend his church. Right. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't cross the line of authority here and go and dedicate another baby uh, to God that they go to another church. So we've got to understand that we've got to have respect for different ministries. And if they're preaching Jesus, then uh, they're a valid ministry. They may not believe in being filled with the Spirit and all of that, but they could if they could read the Scripture. So we assume then that the parent are, are the parents, hopefully, are part of the church and that they're saved. And there again, I don't think that, that I could uh, dedicate a baby to God if the parents weren't Christians. I don't think I could. I might, not formally, but I, I could certainly uh, try to lead them to the Lord yes. first. Because after all, the baby's in a state of innocence, and, and, you know, and all chances are that if the baby died, he'd go to heaven. He or she'd go to heaven because of innocence. But there's some truth to the blood being applied to one parent or both parents. Uh, it seems to carry a certain amount of sanctifying process to the child. Uh, it could be, and then this is not always the case, but it could be that, well, not could be, I'm sure that it is from my, from my viewpoint of 30 years, is uh, children that are raised in a Christian home are more apt to do something for God. Yes, Isn't that right? Yes, yes. I mean, if, if you're raised in a heathen home, they don't know God, uh, God can intervene and, and, and save that child and bring that person to some kind of ministry like he did me. But I mean, that's a rarity. For the most part, uh, God uses the children that are raised in a Christian home. They've, they've got 20, 30 years jump on, right. on somebody who gets saved in, in late years of life. Yes. 20, 30 years old and gets saved. Well, you know, a child has been raised in church and taught the Word. They're, they're way ahead. That's right. So it's, it's a blessing then to have one or both parents saved under the blood, washed in the blood, as far as their children is concerned. Um, 
And now I think we'll just look at a, a few scriptures, and we don't have a long lesson today. But I hope that, that what little we've said has, has helped you in some manner to, uh, to know how to conduct baby dedications uh, in the church service. We're going to look at a few scriptures now, and that'll be all this lesson. Uh, Proverbs 10, 13. Now, I said a while ago that, that when you're dedicating a baby, we, there's a certain charge and a rededication principle that goes to the parents. We must bring them into being accountable to God for their child and responsible to God for that child. And I believe that if the parents are, how could I say it, uh, totally committed to this kid, to this child, and are sincere mm. in the dedication that God will protect that child. God will oh, yeah. use that child in the ministry however he can to bring more souls in the kingdom. Oh, I'm yeah. For sure. When a couple of weeks ago we were talking about angels being assigned to the little ones. Yes. That God has guardian angels that he assigns so to take care of them. And, and uh, it's a win-win situation whenever you're serving God. What we want to do is is to help the ministers, if we can, in some way, to uh, become more familiar with us through these tapes and uh, prepare them for the great crusade we're going to have, Lord willing, next summer, about July or thereabouts. And I think that just sitting and listening to these tapes, as my son Seth learns how to pan left and right and zoom in and out, uh, you can become more familiar with us. And when we get there, it'll be like you know us. Right, right. <laughs> we'll be ready for revival. We'll be ready. Yes. Uh, I was thinking a year and a half ago when we were in uh, uh, Zambia, I guess it was. If we counted the souls that were saved uh, in the crusade and the souls that were saved in the school, which you didn't get to go with me, but my mm. brother <laughs> Monty went with me. Uh, 400 souls, 400. I calculate. 400 souls. Praise God. And um, that, that comes down to about, that's just, that's scratching the surface. Next time it's going to be maybe 4,000, who knows. But um, that's about 10 American dollars a soul or thereabouts that it costs. I don't know how many quatches that is. <laughs> but there's also been more since we've left. Oh, yeah. Every church yeah. has, has so, felt the repercussions of, yeah. of it, actually. And like Brother Paul says, you know, our spiritual son, he, he thinks all of Zambia would be touched by what little we can do. And I, I think that he's right if we do it properly. You just can't go in and, and win a bunch of people to the Lord and have no, no church to put them in. Right. So our call then as apostles is to, is to help mentor the sons in the faith and those that are that are pastors there just starting, they're all pretty young, haven't been saved very long, and and uh, if we can get them grounded in the basics, then when we have the big crusade, we can they'll have a, a place already established for them to attend church and be taught the word. Amen. That's really our call. It's not to do their job. <laughs> we have our own job here, plus there, and and other 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 things to do. So. We'll close this with the Proverbs. Well, we talked about Proverbs ten thirteen, didn't we? Did you read that? I don't mm -hmm. remember. Let's no. read that one. Proverbs ten thirteen says, "In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found; but a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding." Uh oh. <laughs> you know what a rod is? Yes, it's I a do. Stick. <laughs> <laughs> it's a stick, and that stick. We call it. We call a plan the board of education to the seat of knowledge. That's what we tell it. <laughs> we tell it here. And the Bible, believe it or not, charges the parents that they must correct their child. But here in America, and I'm sure it could be the same there, is that we want the church to do it. Oh no. Now you know you can't even raise your hand in the store around here that get thrown in jail, especially you know if you slap your kid or whatever. But we're talking about correcting your, your child and the parents. If the parents love their child, they will do the correcting. Yes. 
I mean, they may cut up in church, but when they get home, it's time to get out the stick. <laughs> <laughs> Look at uh, 1324 Proverbs. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. I wonder what be times often. means. Often. Lots. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots. <laughs> Well, my grandma could, my mom could get out the old weeping willow tree and just whop you, man. And whenever yes, she whopped yes. you, you knew it. My dad wore a big, thick belt about like that. Uh -huh. That wide and that thick. And man, if he rolled that thing across your lower extremities, you knew it. I remember my father taking his belt out like this. And then he fold it over and snap it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, every mm -hmm. time I see somebody pulling their belt out, it still sends chills down my spine. <laughs> 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 See, we laugh about this stuff, but, but God expects the parents to discipline the child. Yes. They bring them to church. What's wrong with my kid? He's got, no, he acts that way at home. Yep. That's right. And, you know, we've got to teach them. And, and here in America, it's, it's apparent that the parents haven't been taught anything. So now we've got to teach the parents and the kids. <laughs> well, you can only do it as the Lord enables you to do it. Love then compels discipline. Um, could you read that again? 1324. There was another nugget there I wanted to pull out of that. Yeah. 1324. 1324. He that spareth his rod hates his son. But okay, he that's, that, excuse that me. One? So if we know the child needs corrected or spanked if it's serious enough, and we probably let him slide too much. We probably don't spank them enough and think, well, that's not serious enough. But how serious is serious? If, if we had a cookie jar on the table and, and we told our son, don't get another cookie. You've had enough. Don't get another cookie. And then we come, we come back in the house 10 minutes later and the cookie jar has been moved. All right. And the lid wouldn't put back on it right. And we look to our son and we say, didn't I tell you not to get another cookie? Did you get another cookie? He goes, no, daddy. And there's crumbs on his face. <laughs> you better whip him. Zoom in on me. <laughs> you better spank the child. Well, it's not so bad, you know, getting a cookie. No, what's bad is lying. We've got to beat the lion. You know, actually, you can zoom back now. You've got, you got to break the child's spirit. I know that's not taught because we think it's cruel. No. Well, let's look at another scripture. Uh, Proverbs twenty-two fifteen. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from it. Okay, now what's in a child? Foolishness. Foolishness. Yep. Foolishness. If we had a little rubber ducky, I don't know, I'll have to send Paul a rubber ducky. <laughs> it's a little rubber duck that you put in the bath water, you know, for kids. Quack, quack. And you, you take two two-year-old children and you set them in the floor and you put the ducky in between them and you're going to find out how evil they really are. You know that? Yeah. They'll do anything to get that ducky. They'll kick, they'll Pull claw. Hair. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, foolishness is in a child from the cradle on. They're spoiled. They're, they learn how to manipulate the parents, have their way, cry, which we'll get to here in a minute. So, if there's no rod, foolishness remains. Now, the Lord told me that. If there's no rod applied to a child, we're about right. If we never spank our child, never correct our child, then when he grows up, he's not going to lie to us, but he'll be lying to God. Yes. Going to wind up in jail, no telling where all the cause we did not way back here do what God requires of us as parents. And so this charge must go to parents. You know, what comes to my mind is there's a scripture, I believe, that it's in Psalms, I believe David, one of the Psalm that says, A fool is said in his heart, there is no God. 
-hmm. So yeah. if the child's not corrected, it's possible later on that foolishness, like you said, remains with them. Yeah. And then they don't know God. No. Or they don't believe in God. So what we're saying then is very possible that the parent could cost the child's soul. Yeah. So we're dealing with spiritual things here that seems natural, but actually it's serious. So the way I see it, if there's no rod applied to the child during growth and childhood years, the foolishness remains even into adulthood. Man, I've seen a lot of grown people, they need to be whipped. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> but you see, the older a person gets, the more stubborn they become, and it's hard to, to do anything with them. That's the reason that the army, uh, the, the military, wants to get young people in. You know, 18 years old, yes. 20, because they're easy to take orders. They're, you know, they, they're not... Teachable. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they are teachable. But they don't want any old people in the military because they're rebellious. And it's the same way in the church. Mm -hmm. We need to get people to the Lord whenever they're young. Whenever they're young. Because the data shows the older you get, the more difficult it is to do anything with them. I mean, I'm talking about the older a person gets. The more difficult it is for them to be right with God. They get thinking, I don't need God. But they do. It all starts way back here in the cradle. Let's look at uh, a couple more and then we'll be through. Uh, Proverbs 23, 13. Twenty three thirteen. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. I'm going to verse fourteen. Sure. There. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, <laughs> <laughs> and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Well, we need to <laughs> we need to read that again, and we don't need to paraphrase it. That's for sure. So if we if we beat our child with a rod, we save his soul from hell. That's right. Amen. So how serious is this? Very serious. You know, it, maybe you ought to read it again. I don't think the audience got it. Okay. Verse, well, uh, Proverbs 23, 13. Mm -hmm. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. All right. But I've, I've raised two and a half children. And I've noticed that if you tell them that you're going to get a spanking, and uh, you don't do it, they're going to push you next time a little further. Uh, so what you've got to do is, to, if you tell them you're going to give them a spanking, then you've got to do it to, to stick to your word. And you need to be sure you do it in love, but you need to do it firmly. And they'll start crying. And they'll, they'll try to, oh, you're going to kill me. No, no, no. <laughs> you know? and, and the Bible says, spare not. Do not allow their uh, fake cries to stop you from discipline because we, we're going to save the soul from hell uh, whenever we do what the Word of God says to do. And the last scripture is Proverbs nineteen eighteen. Chasten thy son while there is hope and let not thy soul spare for his crying. There it is. Yes. So if your son begins to cry, and oh, please don't, please, I won't do it no more, please, no, no. You know what? You need to lay it on heavy. <laughs> you need to just go ahead. Now, why is it that we always want to spank somebody else's kid? You notice that? <laughs> <laughs> That's my kid, I'd spank that kid. My kid wouldn't act that way. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. uh-huh. We're blind to our own. <laughs> As my dad, he... <clears throat> He had this fancy guitar case, and, and I was about two years old, and they were over playing music one night at, at his friend's house, and he had a fancy guitar case, his friend did, and he took his guitar out, and his little son got in that guitar case and was, you know, crawling around, slamming the lid, and just tearing up a $100 guitar case. And my dad said, my son will never do that, but you know what? Little Randy did. <laughs> there was a time little Randy crawled on my dad's guitar case, and but dad didn't spank me, and that's why I'm in the mess I'm in today. <laughs> no. Uh, well, you know, things got a way of coming back on us. So if we could read that again, Proverbs 19, 18. Chasing thy son while there is hope, 
and let not thy soul spare for his crying. While there's hope. Could it be that it's possible that a, a person, there is no hope, I mean, very little hope. Their, their, their soul is callous, they grow up like a weed, and it's more difficult to get them to the Lord. Yeah. So we need to do it God's way. So I hope this has been a little blessing to you and, and helped a little bit in, in children's dedication. And now we pray. Father, I thank you for the listeners today. I thank you, Lord, that, that they have ears to hear what we've said and may the Holy Spirit bring these uh, natural truths into their hearts and lives. And, and may you empower them with your spirit, I pray. And may